Morning, everybody. What is wrong with winter chill models in warm climates? My co-workers are Laura Alderman and Nigel Cook. Dormancy progression, a bit of an overview on dormancy progression, specific focus on apples. Apples originate from Kazakhstan, which is in the middle of the world, and they are well adapted to withstand really harsh winter conditions. And they do this by going dormant. During autumn, the meristems form bud scales, all growth stops until the um, such time that, that, that winter passes and the buds accumulate sufficient chill, the process is reversed and growth resumes in spring. Dormancy is not just a survival tool, but also the plant's reset button to allow for synchronized bud, uh, growth and bud break in the, in the spring. We can measure this dormancy progression very successfully in the laboratory um, by going out and collecting one-year-old shoots in the orchard throughout the winter period and incubating them at optimal growth conditions. We then monitor to see how long it takes for these buds to break as an indication of how dormant they are. We can use this data to plot dormancy progression curves, which clearly shows with the yellow arrow three phases of dormancy, the induction or the entrance into dormancy, when it hits a maximum dormancy, and then once it's received sufficient amount of chill, it starts to release from dormancy, and we saw the exit from dormancy. From previous um, research by Cook and Jacobs, we know that this dormancy progression curve happens quite differently in warm winter conditions. In warm winters, the yellow arrow shows, we see a protracted longer entrance into dormancy, um, which results in low bud break, compared to a shorter, that we see in the Koa-Bockefeld area, shorter entrance into dormancy, and a better, higher bud break resulting from that. How do we measure and how do we know what is sufficient chill for synchronized bud break? Everybody in this room knows about chill models. I want to quickly, very briefly, just mention the four chill models that we are investigating. First of all, this started all about 70 years odd ago, the chilling hours model, where um, chill accumulation is expressed as the number of hours between 0 and 7.2 degrees. There's the Utah or the Richardson model that assigns different weights to a temperature or a bell-shaped curve um, with a sweet spot between one and a half degrees to 12 degrees and then treating temperatures higher than 16 degrees as a negative. And then um, the positive Utah or the Infratech model, which is based on the Utah model but ignores the daily negative sum of high temperatures and normally gives us values in warm winter areas that are lower than that of the Utah model. And then lastly, the dynamic model, which is the most complex of them, uses a reversible two-step process and is measure measured in chill portions. So what did we do? What was our aim with our experiment? So we aim to investigate the accuracy of these four modules, the models that I've just explained in terms of the entrance and exit phases of dormancy. How did we do this? We did forcing experiments by collecting shoots from two contrasting areas, Ceres and Algon. And we also, once we had the shoots back in the lab, gave them additional chill in various ways, as you can see in this table, um, according to these um, models. We used our data then um, to plot these dormancy progression curves, and this modeling allowed us to really understand which of our samples belongs to the entrance into dormancy phase and which of our samples belongs to the exit phase. And once we knew that, we could really investigate and tear these two dormancy phases apart and investigate the accuracy of by which these models actually predict or, in, or give us insight into chill accumulation. Our results up here indicate um, series and algon in the two blocks. Um, I'm only showing data for the Utah model and for the positive um, or the Infratech model, but we got similar results for the other two models. 
on your left hand side in the yellow block, this is the entrance into dormancy. And you can clearly see, I want you to focus on, on how the data points are scattered around the, the linear line, which really indicates the data points being all over, not truly following that um, linear line, which shows that the models um, do not really indicate chill accumulation very well, not at all. If you look at the R square values, which are very low, the models really struggle to predict the entrance in, into dormancy. Compared to the exit into dormancy, which I'll get to just now, Back to the entrance, if you look at um, the, the orange circles, indicate for a specific um, chill accumulation, one would expect your samples to all have the same dormancy level, but that is not true. You can see how scattered it is. Compared to the exit, where the data points are much more aligned with a linear line, and you can see on the smaller yellow circles there that for a very specific um, chill accumulation, the samples behaved more similarly um, in that one. What is our conclusions from our results? The current chill models that we evaluated are really good predictors or give us good information about chill accumulation in the dormancy release phase. But this is not true for dormancy induction. The models are not well suited at all to measure the biological processes that happen during dormancy induction. Um, the two processes seem to be vastly different. We cannot measure um, this using the same models and the same thinking. Um, this really calls for, for a different thought process when, when we look at entrance and exit. So the short answer is, what is wrong with wi um, winter chill models in warm climates? They are not suited to measure the entrance into dormancy. And because this is so accentuated in warm winter areas, the mistake that these models make are much larger in the warm winter areas. Thank you.